just this year in 2023, a missing persons case that had been cold for three decades was solved. It was the best possible outcome as the missing person was still alive despite being legally dead for years. Yet it remains a mystery why she didn't seem to want to be found. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, and we have another survival story. Not necessarily survival, more like a mystery as to how this occurred. And it remains a mystery in some parts today that we do know that she did make it all of these years, even though her entire family believed that she was dead. So let's go ahead and get into the story. So it was 1992 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Patricia Copta was a then adult at that time, but she had been a straight A student who did modeling and was a dance instructor. And she continued dancing at ballroom events when she went on to get a job in finance after high school. She was known to love the ocean, the beach, the warm sunshine. That's where she thrived. And so she would often go to Puerto Rico with her friends on vacation whenever they could. Eventually she would meet Bob Copta and his boat on the river and he would end up giving her and her friends a ride and the two fell in love. Bob would describe Patricia as the typical Roman Catholic suburbanite. She traveled for work during the week and worshipped at church on the weekends and her family called her Patty. After about 10 years though, Patricia would go on to quit her job due to suffering from migraines. She had gone to her doctor and her doctor said it was most likely stress and so she quit her job to to go to a job that wasn't necessarily as stressful. In fact, she got the job as an elevator operator at the Art Institute of Pittsburgh, and she really, really enjoyed this. There, though, everything would change because in 1984, she would confess to her family that she had seen an angel at her job. And during this time, Bob also noticed that she was ranting about the Virgin Mary, that Virgin Mary had come to her to tell her about impending nuclear Armageddon. It was bound to happen. Eventually, due to this and her state of mind, she lost her job at the Art Institute. And Bob believed that something must have happened or someone must have gotten to her about the whole end of the world thing that she would not stop talking about. And this only escalated from there. She began to start preaching in public, not necessarily at a church, just kind of on the street. She would go out in Pittsburgh talking to people. Patricia was then named the Sparrow because she was so small and she was always in parking lots or busy roads telling citizens about the end of the world. She was deemed the street preacher because at any big event such as a baseball game or a concert, she was known to go there strictly to tell people to go home because the end of the world was happening in three days. She believed that she was chosen as one of God's 144,000 bond servants on earth and that she needed to give up all of her other hobbies and devote her life to spreading the word of God. God bless you. Thank you for allowing me this time a revelation happened in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I'd like to tell you about it. An angel was sent to me in an art school to fulfill the scriptures, very phenomenally in front of many witnesses. Before I tell you the story of an angel sent to me, let me point to 35 countries in Europe where our Blessed Mother, the Mother of Christ, appeared the same exact message coming out of 35 separate countries, also other appearances of angels. The message, the return of Christ, very, very soon to happen. Jesus will lift off the earth, all repented, protect them totally from the nuclear war about to happen. All holy and blessed will be taken into heaven, off the earth without death, called the rapture of the church, called the first resurrection. An angel was sent to me in an art school with the message that Jesus is returning to lift the blessed into heaven, protect you from all punishments to come on the earth. Our Blessed Mother sent nationwide, us that Jesus is returning, sent nationwide to give us guidance and help. God's great mercy and love in all of these miracles to announce his return. Remember Jesus shed his blood for you that you would enter God's holy kingdom. You must return to holiness in order to enter God's holy kingdom. The great gift of all, the beautiful rapture of the church, 
be thankful to our Holy Blessed Trinity who blessed us so by giving us the rapture of the Church. Thank you for your time. God bless you, Little Sparrow. Now, concerned family did bring her to the doctor at one point, and they would end up diagnosing Patricia with delusions of grandeur and said that this showed signs that she could possibly have schizophrenia. And so she was briefly institutionalized, and then she was released not long after that. But Patricia did not like that. She did not want to go back, and she feared that she would have to go back there again. Now, around 1991, Patricia was having some arrests due to her behavior. She was well known around the community to kind of be just this very loud, outspoken woman. But at this point, she had said that she had been mugged by some women who stole her engagement and wedding rings. But that was one of the last big stories before in 1992, after 20 years of marriage, Bob came home one night and Patricia was gone. She was nowhere to be found. She was searched for on the streets. Eventually, Bob reported her missing. They could not find her anywhere. Some family did say that Patricia had made comments that she was worried about being institutionalized again, that she was going to be placed into some sort of care facility, and that she was leaving so she wouldn't be. However, due to her state of mind and Patricia wandering off alone, her family was very worried about where she would end up. But on the day of June 20th, 1992, she was believed to be an endangered missing person. They all hoped that she would be found in the area that she hadn't made it far, but when they searched, they could not find any evidence of her anywhere. Family nor the police knew where she could have gone or if she was already dead. Police were so baffled that they even went to a psychic for answers and the psychic claimed that Patricia had died and that her body was near a body of water. But, you know, searching those kind of areas didn't lead to Patricia either. She was 52 years old at the time and though she was a grown adult who could just leave anytime she wanted, the fact that her state of mind wasn't the best and her mental illnesses or possible mental illnesses kind of made her have these certain visions and ideals made her family very, very concerned. So Bob took the search into his own hands at this time and he knew that his wife loved Puerto Rico because she had always gone on vacation there. She wanted to be in a sunny climate. And so he ended up publishing ads in the newspaper in Puerto Rico for her to see if anybody had seen her to bring her home. And he ended up getting zero responses. He had no idea though that he was on the right track. All he knew was that he was running out of money and could not keep doing that. Bob said that throughout the years, every time a body was found, he wondered if it was Patricia, no matter where it was in the world, because nobody knew where she had gone. But her case sat on a shelf in the Ross Township Police Department with no leads for years. And so, seven years later, in 1999, Bob was given a death certificate for his wife, as everyone presumed she was deceased. However, they were all very wrong. Now, I want to get into a little bit about how much of an impact Patricia had on the community with her words of God and personality. And there was a Post-Gazette article that was actually written about her after she vanished saying the sparrow was a fixture at Gateway Center on the streets of Oakland outside Three Rivers Stadium and sometimes in the middle of McKnight Road where she'd lean into open car windows at traffic lights and inform startled drivers of God's impending wrath. The article written by Dennis Roddy spoke of Patricia predicting that she would die a martyr's death. In fact, she said she would be beating death. Patricia's twin, Elaine, was interviewed and she said that they find people every day. How could someone just vanish out in the world? Elaine said that she supported Patricia in her street preaching by buying her warm clothes and she just wanted her to enjoy her world. Bob was also interviewed for the article saying that she had actually written him a letter saying that someone was after her, but he also said that Patricia believed someone was always after her. There was even a news segment on W. DVE in 1998 talking about the Sparrow Lady and experiences with Patricia before she vanished. And one story they actually spoke about the fact that they had gone to Jay Leno and Patricia was there in the audience. She showed up for filming and she ended up telling Jay that she was a prophet and that the world was going to end in three days. And the bodyguards went to take her out of 
the studio, obviously, because everyone was laughing because they knew Patricia, they knew that this is what she did. But Jay actually stopped them and let her stay there and she ended up backstage with them. And they just had so many lovely stories that I'll let you hear. Everybody has a sparrow lady story. Everybody Bob just told us, Bob just told us she walked into the wave pool. Her legend. Good. But. Yeah, when I was working at the uh, wave pool after uh, I graduated in 86, um, she would come out to the South Park wave pool and pay admission and she would have the this really, and she wore the same dress every day. It was a really right. long white dress. I mean, in the middle of summer, it, it must have been just so hot and uncomfortable. And she walked down uh, the middle steps and the crowd started to gather because she was pretty loud. I mean, and, and the wave pool was just always packed back then. She walked right into the shallow end and proceeded to walk up until it was about wa waist high. I mean, in this glowing white dress. Glowing white dress. And it was so there. heavy. And, yeah. uh, you know, Water's the waves came on and, and started to drag her down. Yeah. yeah, and we... What'd you do? We had to shut the waves off and somebody had to go in after. Go get her. And, yeah, the whole time and we had to call the county yes. police. Oh, yeah. And no, they all the knew her. Daily thing. I'm going Daily yeah. thing, man. She was always... She was in every day. Every day she was in the police office. Yeah. yeah. What's, your, what's your gig? It was a time where everywhere... Scott and I were every broadcast we did. She <laughs> yeah. was there every single broadcast. Yeah. So, back in 1988... She liked us. <laughs> I, she loved us. She was every... She was a real TV... Yeah, she was a TV listener. Oh, she loved us. She was all over us. And, and sure enough, in 1988, I look up, I'm at the Syria Mosque, and I'm opening for Jay Leno. And Jay Leno's up there on stage, <laughs> and, he, and he's one section of his act where the lights come up, and he's asking questions of the crowd. Oh, that's right! And up in the that's balcony, right. I forgot about Jay this. just turns and goes, Joe, what do you do for a living? And you hear, <laughs> I'm a prophet. <laughs> Everyone in the audience knows who she is. Laughter for like a minute straight, I no one can stop laughing. That. And Jay's like, Joe. You're a prophet. <laughs> Where's going to end in three days? Oh, Where's going to end in three days? You must have seen the show before. He's, he's, he's trying working. to make a joke. The people are rushing to try to get in. They're holding them back. There's a sparrow lady, and she's somehow, <laughs> I'm not kidding you, I have a drink in my hand. There's about maybe 20 people backstage, 20, 25 people. <laughs> I look over. Someone bumps into my elbow. Everyone else, the whole crowd, a herd of people being held out. <laughs> The sparrow lady is next to me. She's, How she get in, I have no she's idea. She's on the list. She's on the list. She's just back there, backstage. I'm right next to the sparrow lady. I'm like, this is a too amazing to me. Oh, that's great. Yeah. But her husband, Bob, he became a retired truck driver and he never remarried. He knew that being her husband after she vanished meant that some people believed that he was a suspect. And that, along with the stress of not knowing where she was, really took a toll on Bob. But then after 31 years missing, the police in Pittsburgh were informed that she could very well be alive. It turned out that back in 1999, the same year that Patricia had been declared legally dead back in Pittsburgh, a woman was found in Puerto Rico. And she was seen wandering the island towns outside of the capital of San Juan by some nursing home employees. So obviously seeing her kind of out of it, distraught, they took her back to the home that they worked at and they were asking her questions, trying to learn more about her. And she allegedly refused to tell them anything. She did say that she had taken a cruise ship from Europe to get there, but when they looked into this, they had no records that she was ever on a cruise ship. And so for many years, without her wanting to cooperate or tell them anything, no one could say who she was or where she came from. For the next 30 years, this woman remained in this care home, 1,700 miles away from her home, while her family mourned the loss of her. That was until her health began to deteriorate because she was 82 years old at this point and developing dementia. And that dementia would make this normally tight-lipped woman begin to tell the story about her past. And from little things she was saying, the care workers were able to put it together. And Interpol then got involved as well as the Puerto Rican social worker. And that is when they pieced it together and they contacted the Ross Township Police, who at this time only had that dusty box of useless information. Deputy Police Chief Brian Colhep was told that they believed that they could help solve one of their cold cases. At this point, the police in Pittsburgh were given a sample of this woman in Puerto Rico's DNA to compare it to family members because the police in Pittsburgh said that she was most likely not going to reveal her existence on her own or admit that she was Patricia, but they had DNA samples from Patricia's family members who were actually her sister and her nephew who volunteered to do so. And they also got Patricia's dental records and they tested them for the next nine months. The next year, so after 31 years of being missing, the results came back and this woman was Patricia Copta, alive and well. 
Patricia Cobda was reported missing by her husband, who's here with us today, uh, back in 1992. She was well known through the Pittsburgh area as a street preacher, commonly carried the nickname The Sparrow. Uh, there's plenty of information online, articles from when she went missing, as well as stories about things that she did um, and tales of her street preaching throughout the Pittsburgh area. We've had a number of uh, investigative leads through the years, but nothing that has proven to any kind of fruition until uh, earlier. At that time, we sent them what's called a buckle swab, which is a cheek swab, which gets a DNA sample, and we received that DNA sample from her. We also then were able to get a DNA sample from her living sister here who's with me, Gloria Smith, uh, as well as a surviving nephew of uh, Ms. Copta. These were all then sent to a lab who did a familial test on the DNA and were able to provide us with conclusive results that the woman is indeed Patricia Copta, who is still alive and currently living in Puerto Rico. We went back and forth. It took a while to get them to do the DNA swab for us. We were trying to do forensic odontology, and we were trying to get, we had our dental records from here. We were trying to get dental records from down there because it's a lot quicker than doing DNA. Um, after trying to do that for a while, we were unsuccessful. They weren't able to get uh, dental x-rays down there. So then we sent them the DNA swab, but DNA tests take a long time. And this is stuff we had to use a private lab for because crime labs don't do familial DNA. So we had to send it to a private lab and, and incur those expenses and as well as wait on their timeline to get this back. Although her disappearance wasn't overtly suspicious, I mean, we knew that she had a mental health history and she had made statements to other family individuals that she was leaving, that she was concerned that she was going to be placed into a care facility here. So it was being investigated as a missing person. However, we weren't following a lot of leads that were suspicious. A lot of the leads we followed were that she did leave of her own volition. Um, you know, the, the big joy in that is being able to pass it on to the family. So to have them uh, to have them be able to experience that and know that, that she is alive and doing well. And Patricia's sister, Gloria Smith, said, I didn't believe it. I was in total shock. We really thought she was dead all those years. We didn't expect it. It was a very big shock to see, to know that she was still alive. And we're so happy. I hope I can get down to see her. She thought she was doing God's will. Yeah. And she was had a good heart. She's a very gentle spirit, and she's a very good and loving person. And she was just trying to help people. She was trying to tell them that of what's coming. Bob has said that he has tried to forget about the whole thing and now he can because he knows what happened and that she was taken care of and you know Bob has spoken about wanting to bring her home but at the same time not wanting to visit because she could have come home at any time and that's just what she wanted was to be there and she wanted to be in a warmer climate and so I think he's kind of just on the fence about you know is he even wanted would she want to see him and that's very much heartbreaking. But Patricia's sister Gloria said that due to Patricia's declining health, they probably won't be able to move her back to Pittsburgh. Though this wasn't an all-around happy story for Patricia's family, especially because now they knew they had missed out on 30 years and didn't know why she would have abandoned them, but also because Patricia had a twin and that twin had passed away before knowing that her twin was still alive. Patricia has allegedly told her care staff in Puerto Rico that she wants to remain there. She does not want to go back home. But Patricia has allegedly not said any more since the discovery that she is Patricia, this missing woman. And it's still a mystery whether she decided to leave that day, if she chose it at all, or if it was just kind of some sort of mental illness that had taken over her and that she didn't really understand what she was doing, that she went to a place where she knew due to vacationing. We don't really know how she ended up there and why she doesn't want to come back. Did she forget about her family for those 31 years or did she choose not to contact them at all? Was she so unhappy that she left? Was she afraid of being in this care facility even though at this point she was in some sort of care facility? She was just in Puerto Rico now. There are just so many questions that she doesn't seem to want to answer. Maybe she can at this point in her life, especially with her dementia, but it is strange that for 31 years she refused to say anything. And I just hope that there wasn't something that occurred that made her need to flee or that made her feel like she had no choice but to run. But it is just so incredibly strange that I know that mental illness has led to a lot of missing people and disappearances, and a lot of them are never found. So it is wonderful that her family has that closure and the relief that she was taking care of the whole time. I do wish Patricia would tell her story of exactly what happened all those years ago, but we may never know. And it's just wonderful that those caregivers did find her in Puerto Rico and took care of her for decades without even knowing who she was or really how to help her or any history of her mental illness. They just 
took her in and made sure she was safe. And that is so beautiful to hear. That kind of gives me hope for all of the missing persons that do have that mental illness, that background, and that their family, you know, is so worried that they got into trouble or something happened to them because they couldn't take care of themselves. So it gives me hope that there are people out there that will help somebody even if they don't know what happened. It just makes you hopeful that even after 30 years, she could still be found. She was alive and well. So that is a possibility for so many families of missing people who go every single day without answers. I just love these kind of stories. She was literally in a whole other country. She had completely left and they were still able to locate her because people were working diligently on trying to find who she was in her past. That's all you can do is hope that there are more and more people like that out there. And so all of these missing people, if not found soon, will be found eventually. I'm very glad that Patricia wasn't left to her own devices, especially if she was suffering. But it just does make you wonder if she could have gotten help for that mental illness, would she have wanted to go back with her family? If it would have been explained to her that the institutionalization was to help her, not to scare her. You know, we don't know what happened when she was institutionalized. We don't know. It could have been a very scary situation, especially back then. And they could have done some horrific things to try to fix her or help her. And, you know, the thought of that could have been so daunting. The fact that she might have had to go back, that that could have caused her to never want to say who she was and never want to face that ever again. But yeah, let me know if you've heard any other stories like this where decades later, years later, these people are found and they are alive and well. Don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay.